Hi, my name is Bruce Blumberg, and I'm a professor of developmental and cell biology, pharmaceutical sciences, and biomedical engineering at the University of California, Irvine. In the previous module, we talked about some of the major players in lipid homeostasis and made the case that certain endocrine disrupting chemicals, called obesogens, can alter the number or function of fat cells. In this module, we're going to discuss the obesogen hypothesis together with evidence and examples that show how obesogens can, and already may, create more and bigger fat cells. We've talked about why obesity is a problem, and we've shown some of the ways our bodies regulate the amounts and locations of fats they contain. We have also explored why we think that chemicals can throw a wrench into the works. The last step is to focus on why it's reasonable to connect the two. The obesogen hypothesis itself simply states that there is a class of endocrine disrupting chemicals right now in our environment, that I call obesogens, that have the ability to cause an increase in human fat and therefore contribute to the obesity epidemic. They manage this by creating new fat cells or by increasing the amount of fat that cells already have in them by increasing appetite, decreasing satiety, or by altering metabolic rate. There is already quite a bit of support for this idea in the scientific literature from other studies that are similar but not exactly like the one the obesogen hypothesis examines. Together, they reveal strong evidence for the need to look at obesogens as a contributing factor to obesity. Let's look at them one at a time. There are in vitro effects we can see in cells, as well as in vivo effects we see in organs and in whole animals, including other mammals. Let's take the example of in vitro effects. We already know that there are chemicals that, when given to human beings, shift the body's lipid balance towards storing more fat. An excellent example is a class of drugs called thiazolidinediones, like Actose and Avandia, which are given to type 2 adult-onset diabetics. This phenomenon has been well documented for more than 15 years. The drugs activate PPR gamma, increasing the expression of its target genes. This has two effects, one intended and the other not. In some cells, activation of PPR gamma increases insulin sensitivity, which reduces blood sugar. However, the drugs have the unwanted side effect of increasing both the number of fat cells and the amount of fat stored in them. There is also ample evidence that chemicals can encourage the development of fat cells in the laboratory. For example, the petri dish on the left is the control, and the dish on the right contains chemicals called phthalates. You can see the same effects with bisphenol A, BPA, or with perfluorooctanoic acid, PFOA, or with tributyl tin, TBT. All of these are obesogens. Let's take the example of tin-based chemicals, which are called organotins. Organotins are found in wood preservatives, anti-fouling paints, which are used on ship hulls to prevent the growth of all sorts of marine organisms, fungicides, miticides, and probably most commonly as heat stabilizers in the production of PVC plastics. Because plastic is everywhere, organotins are also found almost everywhere. An organotin with very potent endocrine disrupting effects is called tributyl tin, or TBT. TBT can have strange effects on living things, even at the level of a few parts per billion. One of the odder things TBT does is to cause a phenomenon called imposex, which turns female mollusks into males, and importantly can also do the same things to vertebrates like fish. Because it can switch the sex of living organisms, it is pretty apparent that TBT is an endocrine disruptor. But how does all this work? We asked the question, which hormone receptors could TBT be activating to cause imposex? We found that TBT was doing something we didn't expect. It was activating RxR and PPR gamma. As we explored in the last module, RxR plays large roles in lipid homeostasis in partnership with PPAR gamma. This RxR-PPR gamma complex is the master regulator for fat cell differentiation, and either partner can be activated. So you have to ask, do EDCs that activate RxR or PPR gamma affect the differentiation of fat cells leading to obesity? Given what we have found so far, where do we stand? We have evidence that EDCs can make humans fat, evidence that EDCs can make cells in a petri dish become fat cells, and evidence that some EDCs work on RxR and PPR gamma. Where does that leave us? Well, one question that comes up is this. Is there evidence that endocrine disrupting chemicals affect the obesity of living mammals? There is. 
In our experiments, we treated mice with tributyltin before they were born, and we looked at how much fat have they stored at birth, if any. The answer, a TBT-exposed embryo is born with a lot of fat already stored. For comparison, let's first look at a specimen from the liver of a normal newborn mouse. You can see that here on the left. These specimens are stained in a way that reveals fat as red. Now, in a newborn mouse's liver, you don't see fat because they haven't stored any yet. But here on the right, you can see the liver of a newborn mouse that has been exposed to TBT, and you can see that it is already loaded with fat. Sadly, the story gets worse. If these mice are allowed to grow up after this prenatal exposure and are given normal food, exercise, and water, the trend toward obesity continues. By six months, the TBT-exposed mice are a little bit fatter. By nine months, they are significantly heftier, and by a year, they are fatter still, even though their lifestyle isn't at all different from the control mouse. In other words, a single prenatal exposure to the obesogen tributyl tin has caused a permanent physiological change to these animals that makes obesity an inextricable part of their makeup. How can this be? Is it possible that we are making the animals hungrier so that they never are satisfied? That doesn't seem likely, but there are a few other scenarios, all of which play out at the cellular level. We may be altering the ability of fat cells to process and store lipids, we call this lipid homeostasis, which makes the cells bigger. Or we may be simply making more fat cells, specifically manufacturing more fat cells by making more preadipocytes from multipotent stromal stem cells, or MSCs. These are cells that can become many different kinds of tissue in the body, such as bone, cartilage, muscle, or fat, when stimulated one way or another. We already know that these MSCs can differentiate into fat cells following exposure to the PPR gamma activator rosiglitazone. The million dollar question is, do they? That is, is TBT inducing MSCs to become fat cells? The answer is yes. The panel on the left shows how the cells look if they are not treated with any chemicals. The image in the middle illustrates what happens if you give the cells a sensitizing cocktail. A few normal cells become fat cells, and you can see that right here in red. The image on the right reveals that if you give the cells tributyl tin, you make a lot of them into fat cells. They are everywhere. So TBT can program these animals to become obese before they are even born by predisposing MSCs to become adipocytes essentially changing the way genes are expressed. Given this research, here are some conclusions we can draw. Organotins are potent activators of RxR and PPR gamma and can drive stem cells to become fat cells in culture. We have tested this and found support in frogs and mice and therefore have reason to believe it works similarly in humans since humans have similar cellular processes. We even know that there are other ways that TBT can affect adipogenesis. It's clear that prenatal exposure permanently alters the adult phenotype with the result that these animals have the predisposition to get fatter throughout their lives. This begs the final question, are we humans exposed to enough TBT to cause the same results that we see in other animals? Unfortunately, the answer seems to be yes. The effects we've seen so far happen at the nanomolar level, and organotins are widely used in PVC plastics and other industrial processes. TBT remains a prevalent contaminant in seafood because it was used for many years to prevent marine life from growing on the hulls of boats and ships, which then washes off into oceans and seas where TBT becomes concentrated in algae, snails, mussels, and other animals fish eat. Eventually, those chemicals move up the food chain and find their way to us. Perhaps most insidiously, organotins are still used in the U.S. as fungicides and miticides on a variety of crops such as nuts, stone fruits, and grapes. Organotins are not very water-soluble, so they stick avidly to the crops that they are applied to, and as a result, find their way into us. We know that the average blood and tissue levels in humans, insofar as they've been measured, are right in the range that they need to be to activate RxR and PPR gamma. So it appears that human exposure to organotins can reach levels that activate the high affinity receptors we've been discussing in this module. Does that mean there is such a thing as an obesogen? There is evidence that prenatal exposure to obesogens reprograms the metabolism of animals or peoples exposed to them, which in turn can cause them to gain weight. That doesn't mean exposed individuals are doomed to become fat, 
but it may mean many of us will be forced to fight a lifetime battle against getting fat. And if you don't fight that battle, the default condition is that your steady state weight will drift up over time. If one of the goals of green chemistry is to leave little or no impact on the environment, then it's clear that we need to reduce the amount of obesogenic chemicals we use because we, and all other living things, are clearly part of the environment. So if we can successfully reduce the use of these chemicals and replace them with safe alternatives, we should see a reduction in obesity. And that will not only be good for the environment, it will be good for us too.